Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 30th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but I think I really mean it this week. We had a lot to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this endorsement, but if PepsiCo, you're out there, let me know. Red Bull size too fat. I got a Starbucks double shot in the house. Maybe Starbucks will sponsor me. They got they have more money than God, don't they? What movie was that? <laughs> yeah, we met at a Starbucks, not at the not at the same one. It was uh they were across the street from each other. Anyway, best in show, I think is what it was. There's a disclaimer. Let me just sum it up real quick. If I can get it to work. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, why I picked the stocks in the current portfolio. I'm getting a lot of questions on them, I guess, because our portfolio is getting pretty full here uh, because a lot of things have been working as of late, as you know. Not, not so much the indices. The indices haven't been doing so great, but there's been a lot of developing uh, trends. Uh, some prior IPOs are still doing really well. A lot of uh, energies have bottomed out and done really well. So it's a, uh, it's been pretty good as of late. Knock on wood. Ow, that hurts my head. Uh, but <laughs> so far so good. So I want to flesh this out and walk you through these. Now, without going into a lot of detail, um, just a couple things real quick. I know I always say just uh, a couple things, and it always turns into something much more. The open portfolio is based on a hypothetical uh, account of 100K, and it's 2% per position, and that's if stopped out. You don't take $2,000 and put it into position. You put your stop, so if you get stopped out, you lose $2,000. Now, the stops are based on the volatility of the market. I've got several YouTubes out here, or out there, I should say, on placing stops, so check those out to learn more about that. Uh, so the stops will vary widely depending on the volatility of the position. And that's why the number of shares here varies widely. And what I do is I take the number of shares, let's say in this case, let's just make it round numbers. Let's say it's 500 shares. I divide it into two, two trading loaves or two loaves, I should say. One is a trading loaf and one is a trending loaf. And we're looking for about 1% on the first loaf. So you can see these numbers are close to a thousand. Every night in, you'll see a bigger number in here, and that's because the uh, the stock gapped open and gapped through the profit target. Every night in, you'll see a slightly smaller number, and that is because the stock hit the profit target, but was only there for like a fraction of a second. And if there was only a few hundred shares trading there, and if I couldn't get an offer uh, order off, or nobody else could. Then I look at the time and sales and look at my actual fills and figure out where would be a reasonable spot to exit. So in this case, you got a little bit less than a thousand. But and then the other thing, which I don't actually reflect in this open portfolio, but I talk about quite a bit, is if you're getting close to the profit target, see right here it's 875. Well, this thing came within spitting distance of the profit target within a few cents or two cents. I forget exactly which. We'll take a look at it when we get to the real charts. So in a case like that, you, would, you, you wouldn't split hairs. You'd go ahead and take those partial profits. Remember, this is not where we get rich on this first half. This keeps the lights on. This keeps us in the game. This lets us play. Uh, if the market comes back in and stops us out, at least we got something out of the trade. We got a sweet trade out. Better than the poke in the eye, okay? The real money is in the second loaf. By the way, anything that's highlighted is still open. The reason I keep both parts of the trade in is just to keep the tracking simple. To keep the tracking simple. In other words, so people could see, okay, well, we make this much on the first, and then we make this much on the remainder. Once the second half closes out, I take the whole trade out the open portfolio. Okay, so you can see these numbers on the second loaf. They're not huge, and I hate to use the word yet, but hopefully, uh, and I hate to use the word hopefully too, but. Hopefully, they'll be much bigger than this as we ride out a longer-term trend. So that's how we play the game, okay? And this is where the real money is in this second 
loaf and one or two big winners here can make all the difference in the world. Right now, we're really accurate. I'd rather be less accurate and make more money than be more accurate and make less money. You could make a lot of money and I'm sorry, you could make a little bit of money and be very, very accurate trading or you could make a lot of money and not be that accurate. And that's why I take this hybrid approach to do a little bit of both, to try to get that short term gain, which is a lot easier than long term gain. But then the real money is in the long term. So I stick around for hopefully what turns out to a big, big, big long term trend. Sometimes you'll see a portfolio in the uh, the open model portfolio. And what you'll see is you might see one gain of, let's say, I don't know, ten thousand dollars. And then a couple of gains and losses, small gains and losses. And then down here, you might see like $11,000, okay? Well, that's because you got that one big home run in there. And that's important to trading if you are going to um, – that's important to trading if you are going to uh, follow the trend longer term. Oh, I'm sorry. We had some screen issues. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, the, the point is that you want to, just to recap, just what I, all what I just said, you want to make a swing trade on the first loaf and then hopefully something much bigger on the second loaf. So everything that is that is not highlighted, profits have been taken. Everything that's highlighted is still open. And this was the one right here. This TGA became really, came really close to the profit target. In that case, you wouldn't split hairs. My apologies. We're all messed up today. <laughs> yeah, I just I'm having some growing pains. Uh, we're doing all kinds of new things, as you can tell on the site. Those of you who are on the service, uh, you've been real patient with me. And I appreciate that. We're having all kinds of things um, happening. Let's see if we can do this. All right, let's see. Let me see what you're seeing. Make sure it's working. Okay. Uh, okay, it looks like it's working now. So. Uh, some of you guys weren't seeing the screens. Yeah, I appreciate you hanging in there. Um, again, it's just some growing pains. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited about everything. We've got a new video delivery system that in beta testing was unbelievable, worked great, iPhones, iPads, everything. And then when we, as soon as we flipped the switch, we couldn't even uh, – it wouldn't even load a video. And I actually, I actually uh, sent a message to the CEO of the company saying, hey, I'm not happy, and neither are my people. And it looks like we got it fixed. So uh, thanks for your patience on that. Eventually, it's going to make for a better experience. In the meantime, pardon our dust. Anyway, that's the open portfolio. We can come back to this. Let's um, let's take a look at the setups and why. I'm getting a lot of questions on the setups. Now, right now, before we get into the, this, a little background information on current market conditions. Um, if we back up a little bit, we're going to look at the current market conditions here. But if we back up a couple of months or a couple of weeks even, we're in some of these trigger, uh, positions. Um, I'm sorry, if, uh, some of the longer term positions in the portfolio triggered. You'll know that uh, the markets such as drugs were doing this and biotech was doing this and selected technology was doing this. OK. And right now, these areas, as you'll see in a few minutes when we get to the live charts, aren't doing so well and some of them are pulling back and might set up soon but i'm more excited or at least recently i've been more excited about stocks that have come down and bottomed out such as the energy such as brazil and the second tier tier china stocks that are beginning to rise from the ashes i call it my phoenix pattern or phoenix strategy which is just using a bow tie or first thrust type of pattern as we'll see so I'm more excited about these stocks because I think they have the potential to double or triple or even more off of these major, major bottoms as opposed to these stocks that are up at these frothy levels. Now, I've been feeling that way for quite a while. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I've been feeling that way for quite a while. And over the last week, especially just yesterday, we've seen this vicious sector rotation. So my gut was correct on that that maybe some of these older trends are getting tired and maybe it's time for some new trends to develop. So today you're going to see a lot of bottoming patterns, a lot of bow ties that are in the portfolio, especially in the more recent setups. And the reason is the energies, Brazil, second tier China stocks, all of these areas 
begin to have some really nice bottoms and begin to take off. And some of those older trends look like they're a little tired, maybe a little long in the tooth. So if you're just seeing me, that people make the mistake a lot of times, and I'm getting a lot of emails now. People right now are like, uh, oh, it looks like you just trade bow ties. And we're like, no, no, that's not how it works. And then if we get into a market where we just get the first uh, half profit and it comes right back in, a lot of people email me and say, well, it looks like you only get the half profit and you don't capture your longer term trends. Let's just take profits at the at the half profits. Why don't we just take 100% profits there? And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. So whenever you're looking at something, you have to take it within the context of the overall market. And on a, on a flip side of the of the trends, if we get some great trends, people are always like, well, why do you take partial profits? And I'm like, well, because you don't always capture these great trends. So be careful if you're just looking at one little piece. And I have um, 10 years, of course, we've been having some uh, server problems lately, so we'll get that fixed. But I've got 10 years of the service archives. If you have the time and inclination, go in and download those and see what worked and see what didn't and study them in context of current market conditions and it's going to be a wonderful exercise to learn how to trade uh, without having to spend a dime and or put any capital into harm's way. All right. Now, you look at this stock here. I'm going to go through each one of them. And you just see a big, fat downtrend, okay? And, yeah, I see it, too. And notice I've got the moving averages in here. This is a 10 simple. This is a 20 exponential. And this is a 30 exponential. To those of you who know me, I rarely put any indicators on a chart, but I will occasionally put a moving average. But you can see that this stock has just moved lower and lower and lower, and there were no buy setups anywhere along the way, okay? Now, it tried to rally here, and then begins to pull back. Now, even if you wanted to go after this, it came all the way back in, as you can see. So there's no need to go after this trade at that juncture. And you can see the downtrend continue. Now, something kind of interesting happened. It makes a low here. It makes a low here. It makes a low here. It makes a little bit of a higher low here, okay? And to those with a good eye, you'll say, wait a minute, Dave. That looks like a classical saucer bottom. Reed Edwards and McGee also looks like a, a more modern classic cup and handle a little bit or a saucer and handle, which is uh, William O'Neill, okay? And then also notice that you have a bow tie up. Now, they, they were kind of sloppy in here. You had a little bit of a bow tie back here. And then it kind of uh, consolidated. But the main thing to note is that it did take off from these lows. It did pull back a little bit. And again, you've got multiple bottoms, kind of a saucer to bottom. And then it looks like it's trying to turn the corner. Okay. So it went down. Draw your arrows. It went sideways. And now the little trend is headed up. Now, remember. I'm a big fan of markets that do this and pull back, where you can draw a big arrow and pull back, okay? And that's off the bread and butter, these established trends. But these emerging trends can often offer some incredible opportunities, especially when you got a stock like this that just falls through grace forever, okay? And there are reasons why this happens. Uh, an example, in the IPO webinar, there was a fracking company and there was also an energy company. And if you go to my website, you can click on the recordings and you'll get the, the, the report from that where I have a list of all the IPOs that are currently set up. And we'll take a look at some of them in a minute, maybe if we have time. And what happened was these companies were energies and fracking companies, or just call them energies overall, and they came public at the absolute worst time. But then they bottomed out and now they're beginning to take off. And I think they could provide some wonderful opportunities. Now, this is a steel stock. OK, and when we get to the charts, you'll see with the live charts, you'll see that steel has bottomed out and made a nice trend higher. It's also a Brazil stock. And if you take a look at EWZ, EWZ has also bottomed out looking pretty good. So the combination of these two got me pretty excited about this stock, plus the fact that it made this nice long base in here and began to move higher. So you got a bow tie, a first thrust, and that's why I liked that particular setup. Uh, but Dave, it's kind of a cheap stock. Well, yeah, it's a cheap stock, but it got beaten up. And it's not like it's a penny stock. Uh, it's got pretty decent volume. It's a steel and iron company. It's a real company. Not that it can't go out of business, okay? But it's not a completely 
uh, total, complete and total penny type of stock. Now, here's another one, and this is an IPO, and this is a pattern uh, I've called baby comeback, but sometimes when I dub these new patterns, I'm just using my old core methodology, and I've been incorporating it into some of these new observations that I'm seeing. And what I liked about this company here is that it I didn't I didn't like the fact that it failed when it first came out, but I like the fact that it found its way and began to bottom out. It made this major double bottom. Now I don't trade off a double bottom, but if I see something like a big fat cup bottom and then a pullback, okay. William O'Neill popularized the cup and handle, but you're gonna go back if you go back and, and uh study Schaubacher and uh what's the name of his book? Uh Technical, I can't see it. It's technical analysis of stock market profits. I think I have the list on my, on my website. If you study Schaubacher, Edwards and McGee, and then possibly some more modern classics such as Prig and uh, who else is out there? Murphy, of course. Can't forget Murphy. You'll see a lot of these similar patterns. And uh, William O'Neill did make the cup and hand popular. That's where I first learned about it before I got around to reading all these, these uh, early classics. So I want to make sure he gets credit. But I also want to let you know that these patterns have been around for 100 years. So anyway, it makes a nice bottom and begins to take off. And I call this baby come back. It's like sometimes these IPOs just have absolute worst timing. They, they die. And then you have this comeback strategy. Also, in something like this, because it's an established issue, I'd call it my Phoenix strategy. P-H-O-E, I think, in I-X, where the Phoenix rises from the ashes. So what happens is... It consolidates. The market conditions begin to change. The uh, they get their act together. And sometimes, it's, sometimes consolidation could really could go even years, uh, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, my my buddy Dick Fruth over in uh, Houston wrote a book on that. I think you can get it uh, from Kindle for like ten bucks. It's a I think it's parabolic stock trends or or something. Uh, originally, I was supposed to have my bow tie pattern in, uh, in there, but uh, we didn't get around to getting that set up. Uh, and he uses these long, long term stocks that have bottomed out and his reasoning makes a lot of sense. And it's a lot more well thought than mine. I, I tend to do what I call um, conceptually correct observational finance. And that's a fancy way of saying I look at charts. So I've noticed that a lot of times, and then this is kind of, not really the big picture, but a lot of times they'll, they'll just consolidate for years and years after a long fall from grace. And then you got something like the bow tie of the first thrust. Okay, that could be a wonderful pattern and an established issue. Now, Dick's point is that there's tax loss selling that works its way through the system. People die and all these things happen. And, and the heirs uh, liquidate the shares. And all these things happen while that stock is down in that base and it kind of and the company is still plodding along. The company is still in business. And the company might reinvent itself, okay? Maybe a, um, maybe a mining company figures out a way to frack better or, or figures out, hey, we're fracking to get uh, to get this gold out the ground. And I don't even know if that's true, that they would do that. But uh, maybe they figure out a way to frack better, and then they become an energy company, and then the energy companies begin to take off, okay? Anyway. So in this particular case, getting back to the ruby, well, I guess you thought I never would, you've got a big picture cup and handle. And again, it's what I call baby cup back. Also, look at this trend. It's just working its way higher day after day after day after day after day after day. And then you get a little bit of a pullback, okay? Now, with a transitional pattern, meaning that something's coming off of lows, and this is a great example here, but a couple other ones you're going to see. As soon as you get that one little bar pullback, you need to think about taking it. Okay, if something's in an established trend, you kind of want a nice deep pullback as a general statement. But when something's bottoming out, you look to get in at that first little sign of a pullback. Okay, now you might be early, but so what? That's what stops are for. But if you don't get in early, so to speak, and this thing begins to take off, people waiting for a pullback, you'll never, or if I'm sorry, if you're waiting for a pullback, you'll never get in. Okay, so that's Ruby. Uh, let's take a look at TGA. You notice that TGA sort of looks a little bit like the um, the SID pattern. 
And notice that you've got a long-term downturn. There's nothing to do. There's no need to bottom fish. Oh, it's cheap. It's at six fifty. Now it's at six. Oh, it's even cheaper. Now it's at five. Now it's even cheaper. Now it's at four. Okay. Now it's even cheaper. Now it's at three. So don't try to fish at bottom fish and catch at bottom. Let it hit bottom and let it see how it acts. Now we did have a little rally here, and you might think, well, Dave, why did you go after it here? Well, it did catch my eye. But look what happened. It made lower highs, lower highs, lower highs. This one just a smidge higher. So you want to give them a little room on the entry. And then lower highs, lower high, lower high. And then before you know it, you're all the way back down to the old lows. So just a very simple technique like waiting for entries would have kept you out of this one. Getting in too early at least. And then notice that it begins to bottom out here real nicely. And once again, there's that nice little bottoming cup and handle pattern. Okay. Now, I wouldn't buy a stock just because it makes a double bottom or a cup bottom or any other classical or saucer bottom or any other type of classical technical analysis pattern. But I will I will look for a trigger and a setup, or a setup and a trigger, I should say. So in this particular case, we've got a bow tie, plain as day, okay? Notice that... You didn't have a bow tie here. It was kind of sloppy. You didn't have a bow tie here. It was kind of sloppy. And then the cycles come together, and you have a bow tie right here. And you also have a first thrust, okay? And then notice that this isn't a huge pullback, but, again, we got to wait for or, or we just look for the little bitty tiny pullback and look to get in, okay, on a transitional or emerging trend type of setup. So, again, cup and handle, bow tie, first thrust, a little bit of a pullback. So that's why I liked that one. Now, this is a new issue, and in the webinar we did on Tuesday night, we talked about first pullbacks at IPOs, and this is the first pullback at an IPO. Now, ideally, you'd want to see, if this was just a normal stock, you'd want to see a little bit deeper pullback, but in this case, it looked pretty good. And with IPOs, you're a little bit more lenient. Notice that it just kind of worked its way higher, and then it began to accelerate higher, okay? This is what I call accelerating momentum strategy straight out of my second book, okay? And it's an obvious, obvious pattern. You know, when you first look at my stuff, you might think, well, is this difficult? And the answer is no. If you just pay attention and you don't try to make, make it work on every chart, let the chart come to you. OK, or let the market come to you and just wait until you see markets that look like this was like, oh, well, wait a minute. That's a nice gradual uptrend. And look, oh, it accelerates higher. That's uh, that makes a lot of sense. That's a really obvious chart. The problem that people get into and I don't want to get into too much into psychology today because we, we spend a lot of time on in other webinars. And we don't have enough time. But just a real quick recap, the problem that a lot of people get into is they, they sort of like the stock first and then they want the chart to work. No, like the chart first and then like the stock. So if you can't find if you can't find a yeah, if you can't find a stock that looks like this, then maybe you shouldn't trade, okay, on that particular day. And if you don't trade, so what? The world's not going to come to the end. The good thing is you're not going to lose any money or put it put any capital in harm's way unnecessarily. So again, very obvious, obvious, obvious pattern. And then what happens? It pulls back. And this is what we talked about trading in the webinar to on Tuesday's webinar and you can get that um, if you want that webinar I just I just set everything up on the website and hopefully this will work I think it will um, if you missed it it's no problem let's see if we can get this uh, up here real quick if you missed it no problem it's right right here okay so it says getting started trading IPOs that's a webinar if you click on that uh, you'll get the the webinar and you'll get the list of the IPOs that were set up going into yesterday, and some of them are still set up. So anyway, uh, check check on that, and I'll explain my the first pullback at an IPO pattern. Now NVRO, same sort of thing. Okay, notice that it did kind of work its way higher in here, and then it began to accelerate higher, and then it pulls back. So that's a good looking setup right there. And it's very obvious setup. And that's the that's one of the beauties about IPOs. And that's why I'm on so on fire about trading IPOs right now, is that the, the patterns are so easy to recognize. Now, 
IPOs can be a little bit riskier to trade, and we covered that in the, in the webinar, the full course. We spent a lot of time on that in controlling the risk and money management. And then in Tuesday's webinar, I just kind of touched upon that. But with risk comes reward. And again, we get paid to put capital into harm's way. That's how we make our living. That's how we make our money, right? So as you can see, very obvious pullback set up there. Now, coming to this stock, this is a Chinese stock. It's also a relatively new issue. This is what I call a toddler, T-O-D-D-L-E-R, okay? So IPOs that have been out for one to two years can still provide some pretty amazing opportunities. It's like sometimes they might come public a little too early. Uh, maybe they, like an energy stock I showed the other night, came public right as the energy market topped. Their timing was abysmal. You know, it happens. Pronounce, uh, spell with a silent S-H, right? So things happen in the markets, but sometimes things change and then things improve. Uh, maybe China China rallied up and everybody got excited about China and then the reality set in and then all of a sudden China's back in favor. But notice again, very simple classical technical analysis type of patterns. And you're probably thinking, well, Dave, doesn't it have some overhead resistance? Well, it's got a little bit, but so what? And then with IPOs, you could be a little bit more, I hate to use the word sloppy, but there's some excitement and enthusiasm in them, even when they're a toddler like this, which could make them, which could make these patterns, which are a little bit more sloppy, work. Okay. So every now and then in a real issue, not a real issue, but established issue, this might this might bother me a little bit, but this doesn't bother me as much in an IPO. And also it's not that much of uh, overhead supply it's just a couple of weeks of overhead supply but yeah initially i do see this and then i say well you know what this thing could rally up what 50 percent to get to that overhead supply am i doing my math right let's just use uh, 25 minus 18 what's that uh six let's figure that out okay 30 let's say 35 40 percent so that's 35 40 percent away so even if we do get to the overhead supply, it would still be a pretty good problem to have. Okay. So I did, you can see, if you zoomed in on this, you can see that you do have this nice thrust higher, what I call a first thrust, and you do have a pullback. And again, to those keeping score, it's also a nice little cup and handle type of pattern. Now, by the way, if you are trading these transitional patterns, a lot of people will show me like uh, transitional patterns or what I now call them emerging trend patterns. And they'll show me these patterns in the middle of a trend. And that's okay. And it can work. Okay. But my favorite use of an emerging trend pattern is off of, you guessed it, an emerging trend. So you want to see that trend, like a, you want to see an old trend in and a new one begin. Write that down. You want to see an old one in and a new one begin. And this is another... Uh, Latin America stock, which are doing really well as of late. And you can see it just kind of worked its way lower for a long, long time. Okay. And now it hits these all time lows in here. It looks like it's almost going to go out of business. And then what happens? It begins to have a solid rally off of lows. And then what happens? You have a nice little bow tie higher. So that's why I picked that particular stock. And again, if this is your first show, you're like, oh, this guy just looks for these stocks to buy them out and it buys them off the rally off the lows. Yeah, that's part of what I do, but that's just a very small part of what I do. And right now, that's what's really working well, okay? Now, let's take a look at the – we do have one little lonely short in the portfolio, so let's take a look at that and why I picked it. Now, I'm not a big fan of big, thick stocks. And if you have the stock selection course or if you have the IPO course, you'll know that I spent a lot of time explaining market efficiency. In fact – I have an article. Is it out yet? Uh, I don't know if it's out or not yet. I, I'm having a hard time keeping up with everything. There's so much. Things are moving so fast and there's so much going on. Uh, I've been writing a lot of articles for Traders Magazine. I have an article on efficiency. If somebody if somebody could go to uh, if somebody knows the website, I think it's traders mag or something. Um, I don't know if it's out or not, but I, I'll find out. Anyway, I've got an article on efficiency. If you don't have those courses and if you can wait for the article to come out, um, it'll be out soon. Now, one thing you could do with an efficient stock like UAL 
is a strategy I call the Go Go Domo, and that's on my website under education. And there's a PDF on that if you want to study it. And what I'm looking for there is I'm looking for an ideal, ideally efficient company. It's just the opposite of what I normally do. Okay, we're looking for market inefficiencies in all these stocks we're trading, all these exciting high tech, biotech, uh, Brazilian steel companies, all this kind of stuff. We're looking for inefficiencies in those stocks, but when we're trading something like the go go nobo which is a shorting strategy we're actually looking for the flip side we're looking for like a one-dimensional company something like chipotle a while back when it crashed okay we're looking for something like that that they're not splitting the atom it's a pretty simple process so the reason you want to look for companies that aren't splitting the atom when you go to short them is because let's say you short a biotech and then all of a sudden their drug gets FDA approval or whatever they're trying to cure happens or some little energy company that you think has a snowball's chance in hell and all of a sudden they get it right and they invent some kind of a energy saving device or whatever, then the stock skyrockets it and you're short and you're in a lot of trouble. But if you're shorting an efficient stock, then the company's one dimensional and they're over analyzed and over scrutinized especially if they've, they're up here at new highs, then they become priced for perfection. So you can see it's a little bit of a sloppy pattern, but it's not too bad. You can see you've got a nice little base in here, and then it broke down out that base and a little bit of a pullback, okay? And it's kind of bow tie-ish, but I wouldn't call it a bow tie. I would just say it's a base breakdown and a pullback, okay? So it looks pretty interesting, and you've got a lot of overhead uh, supply in it so that's why I picked this one nice little thrust down breakdown from the base and pulling back a little bit so I think that one has some potential so far and then getting back to the long side uh, somebody who's not in a service was questioning my USO decision is like why did you go after this one again and I'll show you why so what happened was this is uh, this is oil now, oils, oil or in commodities tend to be efficient markets, but every now and then when you're on the fringe, just like I showed you the fringe of an efficient market, such as UAL, an efficient stock, every now and then when you're on the fringe, meaning all-time lows in commodities or multi-year lows in commodities or multi-year or all-time lows in Forex or all-time highs in Forex or multi-year highs in Forex, you could get some big inefficient moves off of those fringes okay so looking at what happened here you can see oil has been in a long 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 term term downtrend and it just looks kind of sold out not that I would ever buy a market because it's sold out but notice that it did make a double bottom now I'm not gonna buy a market because it makes double bottom but when I begin to see a little bit of a signal set up then I'm a little bit more excited about possibly going after a position there. And I think we tried it back here if memory serves and we failed miserably. So what? So what? Sometimes a second mouse gets the cheese. Sometimes it's the um, second setup that works. Okay. So somebody was questioned, questioning why I would go back after the USO. They saw the, the portfolio in one of these uh, chart shows. Well, this is why, because we were wrong here and then it turned out to be, well, it looks like a double bottom. And then also looks like a bow tie. Okay, so again, we're not going to buy the double bottom, but if we see a bow tie and then a bit of a first thrust off the lows, now you really it doesn't look like much here, but if you zoom that chart in, it's going to look more like that. Okay, once you get all the scaling of this thirty, so you know take about take out about eighteen points, and then all of a sudden this is going to fill the chart and it's going to be plain as day. Okay, so you've got a nice little thrust off of lows. Kind of have a double bottom, right? And you got a little bit of a pullback, and you also have a bow tie working. So that's why I like that one. And then this is a little solar stock, and this one's not profitable just yet. It's still set up, by the way. It's set up going into today. So I love showing you live examples. I love showing you things that are set up because if they work, then I'll come back two years from now and say, hey, remember that little solar stock? Was that a buck fifty, buck seventy-five, whatever it is? Now it's at ten bucks a share. Okay. So again, same pattern, kind of rears its ugly head. Longer term downtrend, nothing to do, no bottom fishing necessary. 
But then what happens is it makes a big old saucer and handle, begins to pull back a little bit. You got a little bad memories here, but the bottom action, bottoming action in here looks pretty darn good. So my decision, my executive decision, my what would that decision be? My discretionary decision would say, you know what? I think this thing looks like it's bottomed out. I think it's got enough potential to take out this overhead supply. Also, think about this. Let's say some people bought here, okay? So that was one, two, three, four, five. That was five months ago. There might be uh, there might be some tax loss selling that that occurred somewhere in here. Uh, somebody might have died, God forbid. Somebody might have got divorced, God forbid. Uh, bad things could have happened, okay? And then, so a lot of the supply could have exhausted itself over these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months, whatever it is, okay? Um, now, the next question is, but Dave, how many months do you have to wait? We don't know, okay? But the more months you do wait, the further this is behind you, and we spent a lot of time on this. Not to soft sell you, but we spent a lot of time on this, engaging this and the stock selection course. Okay, so if you do have the course, go in and watch it, and you'll uh, you'll see what I mean. Anyway, a lot of good stuff in that course, if I say so myself. But you can see that this uh, I don't have the bow ties on here, but I think it also bow tied up, and you can see it's beginning to take off, and that it has a nice little pullback in here. So that's why I went after that one. So. Very, very obvious uh, positions, at least I think so. And, and this is the; these are all without the benefit of hindsight because these we actually took these positions, okay? And here they are in the portfolio. And these are two percent positions. So you can see and this is a hundred k account, right? And this is two percent position. So knock on wood, open portfolio. That's a pretty sizable gain given the size of the portfolio. So even at 2%, if when things work, as you can see they are, knock on wood again, uh, you, could, you could have some fairly su substantial gains. Now, let's, um, any questions on any of these setups? I've got, um, let me clean up the, the question and answer things uh, so we could uh, see. But any questions on anything I've talked about so far? Love the voice. Love the voiceover for the subscriber asking you questions. Sounds he sounds kind of impatient. <laughs> you know, my wife says when I imitate her, I sound like Marge Simpson. Like she'll say something, I go. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, we've got about a hundred questions in here. You can't see the screen. We fixed that. Okay. All right. Okay, any questions? Anything we did? Okay, here we go. You recommended XES previously. Is USO better than XES? Uh, XES is better than USO. Okay, John? And let me show you why real quick, and then we'll get to the um, we'll get to the rest. Looks like the, um, looks like my telechart is uh, snagged. Just give me one second. Um, the reason it's better, let me just kind of talk through it while we're waiting on the telechart to come back up. The reason it's um, – how many times I have to tell you? It's probably somebody wanting to get in the show. Um, the reason XES is better is because it's more, it's more inefficient as an ETF than the USO. USO is energy – the actual commodity where XES is energy, the oil service stocks. Okay. Now I would much rather be long something like um, these oil service stocks, such as uh, whatever one we're long TGA. Okay. I'd, I'd much rather be long TGA than something like USO because TGA I think has a much better chance of doubling over a very short period of time than the USO. But again, like I said earlier, sometimes inefficient markets can make – I'm sorry, sometimes efficient markets such as commodities coming off all-time lows or Forex or whatever 
can make some very inefficient moves, provided, of course, they're coming off of these major lows. So let's take a look at XES, which was in the Landry list a couple days ago. And it's just triggering it here uh, yesterday and today. So I would much rather, if I was seeing this, and if I had to decide between this, okay, let's just say we come in, if I had to decide between that and the USO, I would pick this, okay? HV is going to be higher. Let's see what the USO HV is. It's pretty high, though, now. Oh, I, I stand corrected. I thought the HV would be higher in the XES. But anyway, I think this longer term has more potential because it's representing those oil companies, the smaller, more inefficient oil companies, such as TGA, which I think has the potential to double over a short period of time. So I would pick it based on that over the U. Yes. Oh, and the also the USO has made a move recently, which had made that volatility jump. Now it does have a little bit of overhead supply, but again, it's kind of like, well, I'm going to make a a discretionary decision and say I think it could probably get through that overhead supply. And here's the deal. Again, once again, once it gets there, eh, it'd be a good problem to have up 30 percent or so. So I prefer this over the XCO. And at least at this juncture, this is just triggering now. This is still a viable, well, it might be getting away from you now, but a couple of days ago, it sure was certainly a viable uh, setup, okay? All right, now let's uh, let's get back to the charts. Any questions on the charts? Okay. Okay, a couple of um, – let's do an announcement or two, and then let's hop into the uh, live charts. I'm just going to get everybody deleted out of here. Okay. Um, again, if you want the, the – if you missed the IPO webinar the other night, you can go – I've never used Bitly till today. So you guys let me know what you think about that. I think it looks like it's pretty cool. Uh, this is the – can I do a highlighter? That'd be kind of fun to do. Let's see if I can do that. Highlighter. Oh, cool. This is the link. It's free, too. I just showed it to you on my website. So if you want to get the free report, you can just go here. And I listed a list. I have a list of 100 or 97, at least, IPOs that you might want to keep an eye on. This this report, I'm, I'm surprised at how, at how many people are uh, – have requested it, so it's it's kind of exciting. Exciting. And there's a couple of setup IPOs in there that we talked about on Tuesday, and then again the list of IPOs, and then of course the recording to the webinar. So you can go to www.getting-started-trading-ipos, or you can use this um, direct link, which will bring you up here. So check that out if you get a chance. And you're thinking, why the sardine? Well. I've told that story a thousand times. Watch the webinar. Okay. Um, store's open. DaveLander.com store. Or just go to my homepage and click on uh, where it says shop on the homepage. All right. Let's um, – a couple of little housekeeping. Uh, I do have a new improved video delivery service. Uh, we had a couple of glitches with it last week, but it, it shows a lot of promise, and I'm pretty excited about it, and I'm going to stick with it. Uh, until I until uh, prove it otherwise, and I think it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, courses are there, and so are the, the, as you know, the daily service is a video of everything I do, kind of like a compressed little weekend charts every day, <laughs> like a five to ten minute version. And uh, it works great on the iPhone, it works great on the iPad, it works on the iRon. Uh, so so far so good on that. Uh, this is left over from last week, but with any course that I do, I have unlimited lifetime support so that means a year from now two years from now or whatever you can call me up or email me and i will support the course okay put your microphone back in <laughs> rich rich my uh my bike is working okay rich turn your speakers on <laughs> Every now and then, a, well, or either that, or sometimes a squirrel will get his nuts caught in the wires between, uh, uh, between or 
here and uh, me and you. But yeah, it's still working as far as I know. And they are being recorded, so if we do uh, lose it again. Again, thanks for your patience so much on um, while we go through all this. All right, I want to show you this really interesting developing events that are very crucial and very important to pay attention to. And I talked about these things last night uh, in the service. And in tomorrow's column, that's probably going to be what we're going to talk about tomorrow. First of all, let's take a look at the dollar. This is UUP, and let's put in the bow ties, okay? And you'll see that we have what looks like a gatekeeper pattern. Again, that's in my second book. And then what happened is the market began to sell off out of that gatekeeper, and then it made the bow tie down. Now, when you have a bow tie down off of major, major highs, and let's see how many years is this. It's about 10-year highs maybe? It's pretty major. Yeah, it's about 10-year highs or at least six or seven-year highs, nearly the life of, the, of this uh, particular contract. So you've got a bow tie down, and it's beginning to slide pretty seriously. And now you're beginning to get some, some overhead supply in here. So the dollar looks like it's done. Now, before you rush out and try to trade some intermarket technical analysis, remember that, as Murphy himself said, who wrote the book on intermarket technical analysis, said... There could be long lead and lag cycles. So there are some things that happens when the dollar goes down, but that doesn't always happen on a day-by-day -day basis. It takes time sometimes for these things to develop. But one of the relationships that occurs, if you studied his book, and if you've just uh, been around the markets for a little while, you'll know that what happens when the dollar goes down. Well, a lot of commodities are priced in dollars, such as gold, for instance, okay? So commodities that are priced in dollars will begin to go up. Notice steel's beginning to rise in here, and this is why we went after that SID, okay? Because, well, Brazil's also going higher too. I guess a foreign country like Brazil would probably benefit from a lower dollar, or would they? Let me think about that. Maybe that's wrong. So you can get tricked up tripped up pretty quickly <laughs> yeah because they could uh let me think about this no nope, maybe just the opposite but a country that is produces a lot of natural resources i should say can benefit from a lower dollar because um their natural resources will be worth more okay now the other thing that's fascinating to me is that okay bonds bow tied down or first thrust down whatever you want to call it in here they had a little bit of a retrace rally, and now stick a fork in them. It looks like they're done, okay? So one thing that is kind of a fascinating pattern is if you go in and look at markets that are coming off of major, major highs, or in this case, all-time highs, and you get that bow tie down or some other emerging trend pattern, keep an eye on that high, and if you never get back to that high, sometimes that – signals an all-time top so so far based on this bow tie down this first thrust down this 138 is the top and that's going to be the top until proven otherwise okay so go in and look at some of these markets you're going to be fascinated at, at how many tops are called when that occurs now let's take a look at the overall market basis of the peas okay um, S&P 500, bit of a bummer. It's pulled back into its prior range. And if you go all the way back to last November, around Thanksgiving in the U.S., you could see, uh, to those of you outside of the U.S., Thanksgiving is when, we're, when Americans eat a lot of food, kind of like every other day, <laughs> at least for me. Um, anyway, you can see it's pulled back into its range. It hasn't changed much. In months and months and months and months and months. Longer term, though, the uptrend still looks pretty good. And you could do something like put in a, a longer term moving average, like a 200 day moving average. And like I've been saying quite a bit, we've only had a few days of daylight belong, below that moving average, uh, roughly a handful, literally, literally a handful, I guess five days of daylight or so. In this last tremendous run, daylight meaning that the lows, I'm sorry, the highs, no, 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 that's right. 
the lows are greater than the moving average. You could draw a line in between the moving average and the lows of the prices. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So that one little simple technique would have kept you on the right side of the market for the majority of this last move here. Now, before you rush out and try to trade that as a system in and of itself, like I said last week and week before and quite often, everything works better with trend. Okay. So if you do have a trend, then a simple trend following system will work fantastic. If you don't have a trend, eh, then not so much. Okay. All right. So that's the P's. Sideways, shorter term, but not too far from all time highs. We were just at all time highs, what, a few days ago? Last Friday or well, somewhere in there. So were you this close within a percentage or so? That wasn't quite there, was it? Yeah, there it was. When you within a percent or so away from all time highs, you want to err on the side of the longer term trend. It doesn't mean that you might not fire off a short or two, such as the UAL. But as a general statement, you want to focus mostly on the long side when that occurs. And that's why you'll see in the portfolio we're very heavily long at this juncture. NASDAQ, bit of a bummer. It was all-time highs, at least on a closing basis, just about a week ago. And then now it's pulled back in to this god-awful sideways range. Well, one day at a time is what I say. And so far, longer-term uptrend remains intact. But you might want to pull in your horns a little bit based on some of the action in some of the sectors, as I'm going to show you in just one second. Now, today's action into Rusty, down a percent in change. That scores as a bummer, okay? And really don't want to see us break down much further in the Rusty, but it is what it is. And longer term, it's still in an uptrend, and we're not that far, I guess about 2% away now from all-time highs. Yeah, a little bit further, about 3.5% now based on today's action, okay? Longer term uptrend still intact, but when you see something like this, especially in a rusty, what type of stocks would we like to trade? Smaller cap, more inefficient type of stocks. So when you see some action like this happening in, in, in our poster child for those stocks, you probably want to pull in your horns a little bit, at least wait for entries going into these positions. And that in and of itself can often keep you out of a lot of troubles. Again, the energy is looking fantastic in here, still down a little bit today. So what? Kind of major bottom in here, bow tie off of major lows, so far, so good there. Metals and mining, looking pretty darn good, too. Pull it back a little bit today, so what, okay? Still looks like a major bottom remains in place there. Steel stocks, we looked at those quite a bit earlier, and we looked at this earlier. So far, so good. Nice little bow tie, nice little rally out of a cup and handle, saucer and handle. Pull it back a little bit, so what, okay? Uh, for those who missed the first rally, now's a good time to start looking at a place to get in. Uh, on those stocks and guess what if they don't rally up then so what don't trade them okay if they don't go up don't buy them will rogers will rogers trade banks i don't want to rush out and buy banks because they're all over the place but banks have been improving as of late today notwithstanding so that is a bit of a, uh, a a good thing now getting back to bad things take a look at real estate break it down in here it's probably on the heels of interest rates higher rates hurts real estate <laughs> So that's a problem, bit of a problem. Drugs are beginning to break down a little bit in here. Now, don't rush out and sell all your drugs, stocks, okay, just yet. Let them stop out. You get stopped out, so be it. But I'm not liking the action in quite a few of these areas, especially biotech. Notice biotech stalled short of its prior highs in here, and so far it's beginning to break down. Now, sometimes these drugs and biotechs uh, can have nine lives, and that's been the story of this market since 2009. A lot of these areas have had nine lives, which is great because they go in, they correct, they shake out a lot of people, they suck at a lot of naysayers who think that the market will never go back up, and then the market punishes them, punishes them and squeezes them out, okay, and spits them out. This time might be different. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. That's what a trend follower that's what trend following is all about. And you thought it was all about the hokey pokey. No. All right. As you can see, uh, health services becoming a bit of a bummer. Notice that your moving averages have turned down. Now the prices cross through them. 10-day simple, 20-day exponential, 30-day exponential. So we could get a bow tie down in the drugs. Okay. So we got to keep an eye on things. Defense stocks, you can see, beginning to roll over it here. There are some problems. It is coming unglued a little bit. 
Okay, and this is kind of a fluid situation. Two days ago, I was a little bit more excited about the overall market than I am today, and that just as shows that I take things one day at a time. Okay, and I'm not giving up on the market just yet. As long as those indices can hover near their old highs and stay above their longer-term moving averages and kind of hang in there, I'm not going to give up on this market just yet. And even if I did, so to speak, give up on the market, I wouldn't exit any of my longs. I would let my stops take me out, and then I would start putting on a few more shorts. It's taken me a long time to stop trying to outsmart the market, pick the top, and all these other things, and just kind of follow along. And that's how I got the nickname, Trend Following Moron, okay? So what else is happening in here? Software banged down new highs just a day or so ago. And now it's coming back in a little bit. Still looks pretty good. So it's getting a little mixed out there. A few big updates would make all the difference in the world. But that's not happening. Rich doesn't have sound either, huh? Um, sounds fine from what I could tell. Okay. All right. Let's let's uh, let's go ahead and open it up for individual. Uh, thank you, Steven. Sounds good. You said sound is God. <laughs> Uh, good. <laughs> okay. Boogie boogie. All right. Uh, let's open up for stock questions. No stock questions this week, huh? Quiet bunch. Oh, I know you have some. Here we go. Sino on a pullback. All right, let's take a look at that. Let's back to chart out a little bit, see what we see. Um, the only problem I see here is that it's pushing into a lot of uh, a significant amount of overhead supply. Now, it is a ways back, but it is a lot of it. Okay, you got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven months approximately of overhead supply you push it into. That's a lot, okay, um, of trading that happened there. So the market could run into a little bit of trouble. So for me to go after this one, now keep in mind you're not looking at it a week or two ago when that overhead supply is a little further away. See, back here, this overhead supply is a little further away. And like I said, sometimes you can get a swing trade out. But for me to get excited about this one, it would actually have to get all the way past this overhead supply. So I would pass on this one based on that, okay? Yeah, GFA is a – I'm getting asked about GFA. Yeah, do you think GFA was a good pullback yesterday? Yeah, GFA was re-recommended in my service as a uh, – as either an add-on trade or a um, a trade in and of itself. In fact, I think it still looks good right now. I mean, I'm talking about position, but it still looks pretty damn good right now, especially now it's tailed off its, its highest levels a little bit. So, yeah, absolutely. That looks fantastic. Look at the persistent trend in here. You very rarely get such a beautiful persistent trend off of lows. This is a Brazilian stock or Latin American stock, so it's got that buzz working for it right now. Okay. Transports look bad. IYT other than 200. Let's take a look at that. IYT. And I apologize to you guys who are watching the um, record. I'm getting a few emails coming in now saying he can't get in. Uh, I'm working on that. So my apologies. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, I guess for those on the service page, we'll start putting direct links uh, behind the firewall just to make sure we get you guys in. And then um, for everyone else, I'm going to fix it. I promise. That's a quick fix, though. Uh, yeah, he's saying the IYT. Who said that? Um, I already deleted you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't need to turn it in moving average. Yeah, this IYT looks uh, like it could be a little bit of trouble in here. Beginning to break down. So that's that's not a good thing. Um, I'm not a Dow theorist when I ha when it comes to markets, and I don't have to have the transports rally along, but it's nice to have them rallying along. Okay. And this is why when you look at this stock here, this ETF. Transportation average ETF. Now you know why we have UAL as a short on our list, okay? 
Okay, Matt, I'll do that. No problem, buddy. I, I said I would do it, but we had all these we had all these issues that um, came up. Okay, uh, we covered this one in an IPO webinar. Uh, take a look at that. I covered a lot more details. Uh, you can see my little line left over in here. For me to get excited about this one now, it would have to break out to new highs and then pull back. But yeah, definitely keep that one uh, on your radar, but let it break out and then pull back, uh, Rich. Okay. Good. I'm glad Rich can hear me again. Good. Thank you, Rich, for letting me know. URA for Mr. Phil. Um, these uraniums and all these other ones, are, uh, they're, they're a little squirrely now. Okay. Um, and they can be. I, I'm a big fan of these rare earths. We made a lot of money in, I forget which year. Somebody in the service might remind me. 2012, maybe? Life seems to be a blur lately. But anyway, they had a little bit more cleaner structure back then. Now, uranium can be so crazy that I'm going to make some exceptions. And I'm going to say, Phil, Phil's got a good eye. You do have some crazy trading back here. But you got to realize that uranium can be just crazy, okay? So you got a micro little double top knockout. You got a little pullback. Phil, you're going to get a high five on this one. Uh, that looks fantastic. Okay, look at the bow tie here, and you're coming off of all-time lows for the ETF. So absolutely, put that on your radar. Get ready for a bumpy ride. you got to hit a little resistance back here, but I think it's worth a shot. I'm going to make an exception to worried about that resistance because it's a rare earth, and these rare earths can be super volatile, and when they go, they go. But consider yourself warned, okay? But yes, this looks fantastic. Mr. Phil, high five to you. Mr. Phil's across the pond. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I could get, I could broadcast across the pond, but across a state or two, it seems like people lose sound. Somehow it could make it across all the way to Europe. That's a, that's pretty crazy. Dave, thoughts on UEC? Ah, you guys are picking up on this uranium theme. Good job. I've been watching them. Uh, HV is a little rich. Yeah, it's a little high in the HV. Volume is coming good off a of bow tie. All right, let's back the chart out a little bit. Uh, I'm going to say maybe to this one because it's a little dangerous. Maybe that 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 ET I never thought I'd recommend an ETF uh, first, but I'm going to I'm going to say okay to this one, but it's going to be dangerous and it's going to be wild and crazy. Okay, um, don't. I wouldn't bet the form on it, but it sure looks good because it broke out and today you're having a nice little knockout, okay? And then maybe you could put an entry right a little bit above the high, give it a little wiggle room, maybe in here somewhere, and then maybe a stop like at some place where it'd be absolute failure, okay? Way down here, like maybe at 180. Because look at this HV on this thing. It's just, it's getting kind of crazy. So you point, you know, my job is, uh, my job is almost done. You guys are starting to get it, right? Get it. Um Smitty says uh, HV is a little rich, and I'm with you on that, okay? I wouldn't call it so much a bow tie as much as just kind of a kind of a, just a thrust hire, base breakout, but uh, back to chart way out. I mean, it's wide and loose, a little crazy, but that's uranium, okay? It comes with the territory. Yeah, I think the mother all bottoms appears to be in place there once again, okay? My thoughts on eBay as a short. Uh, I'm not a big fan of eBay as a uh, – as a trading vehicle, because it could be a little, I mean, it's usually, let's see if we can find a little, uh, I can't find it quickly. I was going to see if I could find a little electric cardiogram. eBay tends to be electric cardiogram. So I don't think I would trade it as a short. Uh, it's just all over the place. And then you got a big gap higher recently. So let's pass on that one, uh, Leon. John wants to know about CO. CO. Um, this one has caught my eye. I actually put it on one of my momentum lists not that long ago. Sometimes I'll put these wild and crazy stocks on my momentum list, but it is just that. It's a little too wild and crazy, and it's pulled back below its prior little breakout in here. What I would do with this one, it's China, okay? China is exciting right now. There's something going on in China. China's going up. A lot of people have been poo poo in China, okay? Don't poo-poo China. China's going up, okay? Why is it going up? I don't know. Can it keep going up? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Okay. 
But so far, so good. China's doing pretty good. So keep some China stocks on your radar. Keep CO on your radar. It's kind of wild and crazy, but maybe it'll get us act together and some structure. But right now, no, it is not a setup. But do put it on your radar. PBR, I like, Greg. PBR set up. Uh, I could go for a PBR right about now. Throat's getting a little dry. I love this stock, okay? This stock set up back here, and it got away from me. And now it's set up again and looking pretty darn good. You got a nice persistent move from lows. You got a little bit of a pullback. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback. But I think I'm going to make an exception in this case and say, yeah, it, it looks good enough. It's pullback enough. And I think it's worth a shot. So good eye on that one. Uh, that PBR has been on the Landry list forever. So, yeah, it's good. BAL is cotton. All right, let's take a look at that. BAL. Uh, all right, let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's breaking out to new highs. I don't see any structure here just yet, though. Uh, but I hear you. I think Phil brought this up. I hear you, Phil. It's a, it's popping up to new highs. Okay. Um, let it continue to pop out and then look to play the first pullback. China just initiated a third world bank. Oh, okay. What's the name of it? I want, I'll buy it. All right, Steve wants to know about TLT. Steve, we covered that a little while ago. That's TLT is going to be bonds. Uh, stick a fork in them. They are done. Okay, any more? I guess while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule. Sorry for all the snafus. All right, John wants to know about P10. Uh, but I will, I promise we're going to have that those issues resolved over the next couple of weeks. Uh, this one is not that exciting to me. It's it's kind of just climbing its way higher. If you're already long, then it's great when you're long and they just kind of quietly go about their way going higher. But for me, I'd much rather look at something like a PBR at this juncture that's a little bit higher in volatility. It's making a nice little move. And hey, guess what? Petrolio, Brasilio, S.A. Petrobras. Got some buzzwords in here, right? Brazil. Okay. I'd much rather a more exciting stock like that. TGA, you know, is going to look good uh, next time it pulls back in here. Okay. So that would be a lot more exciting to me than something like a P10, which is just kind of crawling its way higher. And then, again, if you're looking to get exposure, XES uh, still looks pretty good in here. Okay, any more questions? I just wonder if there's a PBJ. <laughs> You know, if you feed peanut butter to uh, to ducks, you get peanut butter and quackers. Ooh, grown, huh? <laughs> Better stick to my day job here. Anything else? Let's take a look at the portfolio real quick. And then um, while we're waiting. Yeah, this GFA is coming off of a nice little pullback nicely. It's still set up. So if you want to look, take a look at that one, looks pretty good. Not a whole lot else going on today. Nothing too exciting. Okay, Tesla. Okay, TS. What's the symbol? TSLA? 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 Okay. Um, it's too wide and loose for me. It's kind of bottomed out recently, but for me to get excited about a stock that's bottoming out, it's got to bottom out off of major, major lows. Okay. Like, you know, back here somewhere when it bottomed out, looked pretty good. Um, it's become too wide and loose. It's all over the place. Uh, with this one. Yeah. It's like, uh, you could have a Tesla for 500 a month or whatever it is. Something stupid. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't, Donnie. No, you don't, Donnie. <laughs> Unfortunately, the uh, technology is not quite there yet. I'd like to get like uh, one of those, find one of those Fiskers that um, somebody has abandoned and uh, throw a Chevy 350 in it because those are good looking cars. Have you guys seen those? I guess I'll wait a few years and all these cars with the dead batteries will probably be worth nothing. Then I could put a 350 in them. <laughs> 
put a gas guzzling 350, nice little dual exhaust, maybe hop it up a little bit, you know. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> In my Tesla or a Fisker. <laughs> Big um, environmentally unconscious. You know, those the, they, those cars are actually bad for the environment. Um, but you know what? you got to start somewhere. You've got to start with a new technology. I mean, someday we'll generate our energy from the sun and drive electric cars, and that'd be great. But right now, um, I don't think it's it's viable just yet. And someday it will be. I mean, you know, we're long a solar stock, so I'm hoping it is viable. Uh, Apple's come back in. Apple's going sideways for a while. This is a bit of a bummer as far as I'm concerned, because this Apple is uh, a lot of people going to be watching Apple. And when Apple begins to fail, it's probably going to take down the market with it. At one point in time, it was, it was what, like uh, 25%, 30% of the NASDAQ 100. So obviously when Apple begins to implode a little bit, it's going to put some uh, pressure on the overall market. Okay. China's bank is called AIB. Well, let's take a look at that. AIB or AIB? AIB. Asian, okay, it's not trading yet, though, is it? When it does, I'll catch it in my IPOs. So uh, that'll work. Oh, I just realized I could dismiss you guys. That's cool. don't think so. Yeah, it'll show up. A10. Uh, this is kind of thin. No, I wouldn't trade this. Uh, it's just... You got a big gap down here. Well, I guess that's a good problem to have. It just doesn't look like a like a great stock. Uh, it's thin and lower priced, uh, and it would have to rally past this resistance here. So if it got past here, then you're dealing with this big gap down and everything. Um, I think I would pass for now. Now check back in a couple of months. Maybe if it bottoms out for another couple of months, it might be worth a shot again. Okay. Uh, let's see. F E Y E. I don't have my glasses, Alvin. I can't see that one you didn't put in caps. <laughs> F E Y E. Uh, no, this is just kind of sideways in here. So it'd have to get out of that range for me to get excited about it. Eight is it ultra? A L T A. Now, if it did get out of the range, first pullback might be the way to play that. A L A T R A. All right, let's zoom in and take a look at this one. Uh, this one has caught my eye. It's a deep pullback. It's kind of interesting, okay? It's still a fairly new issue. Uh, what did I talk about in the course? Fly, die, fly. So it's already created a major IPO pattern. Now it's pulled back. If this was a, 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 stab, a more established issue and not a toddler, so to speak, I, I would say avoid it like the plague because the pullback's a little too deep. But I think it's kind of interesting in here. Uh, but the volatility is so high, I don't know if it's worth going after. I mean, it's a, it's 108 in the volatility, so be prepared for a very volatile ride. I think an entry about 52 and change, let's say 53. I mean, you'd have to have a stop way down here around 40. So it would take about 13 points to go after this one. I think it's viable, but I also think it's very dangerous. So – uh, I probably would pass on it, but it, it does it does look interesting because it did it did uh, it did really perform well as an IPO. Even though you had this deep retrace in here, uh, that's pretty normal for an IPO to do that. You had the fly, you had the die, the fly. And I think we had this one. We had this one as a uh, this was actually in the course as a buy back here. Believe it or not. My that's going to be a China stock. And why? Uh, yeah, on a pullback, maybe, but it does have, it's not quite past this old high in here, but it is Chinese. Okay, so let it pull back a little bit and, and let's reevaluate that one. That might be worth a shot. Okay. Why did a rabbit sleep in a refrigerator? It was Westinghouse. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hey, I'm the only one that can tell bad jokes in here, all right? You want to tell bad jokes? You go get you $2,000 a year, go to webinar account, and start telling bad jokes. No, no, I'm just teasing. That's pretty funny. Um, You know, you got a big old gap in here. This one's been catching my eye, and I've been pretty excited about this stock. But every time I look at it, I see this big old gap here, and I just can't get excited about it because of that. But 
it does look good, okay? Avoid the trade, but it does make for a wonderful example of what a stock that bottoms and then pulls back a little bit. Just a beautiful, beautiful cup and handle. But I'm going to pass based on this gap here. But if I didn't have this gap here, this is what you look for in a stock that has bottomed out. That is a beautiful example, okay? You mean you could tell – you could only tell bad jokes, me thinks. Did I say that? I'm the only one that could tell bad jokes in here. <laughs> FPP? FPP? For Howard? FPP? Ah, uh, no, it's too thin. That's just too crazy. I mean uh, – I mean, if you want to go after it on a flyer, uh, it's just it's got these two big one days up, and it looks like it's it's already, I don't know, it's just too crazy. Hey, look at the volume. There's no volume on that. Uh, too crazy. Too. Cra I hear you though. It's probably bottomed out, but this looks like um, uh, this looks like a junk stock. It really does. So I think I'd pass on S Z N passing the gap for fear. Yeah, I agree with you on that. S Z Y N S Z Y. -N. M or N? Yeah, I don't. I, I agree with you on that one. Uh, pass on that because of the gap. I agree, Alvin. If it reaches gaps above supply, will unload. Yeah, I mean that could happen. You know, everything I do is based on is is first of all, it's conceptually correct observational finance. So what does that mean? Observational finance means I look at charts. Fancy way of saying that, right? You know, one day I call myself a trend following moron. Next day I say, oh, it's a conceptually correct observational finance. But observational finance means to look at charts, and then conceptually correct means that there's some psychology behind the pattern. And never forget that's what we're doing is, with technical analysis is we're reading the mind of the market, and we're trying to control our own emotions and capitalize on the emotions of others. So when you see a big fat gap like that, somebody got burnt and somebody is waiting to get off the hook. It's human nature, okay? Not for us trader types. We know what to do. And, of course, if we got stopped out, we got stopped out. We'll probably get stopped out long before that gap. But as a general statement, most people will look to get off the hook. They'll look to get out at break even. And when you get a big gap, overhead supply, that's where they're going to run into uh, trouble. Uh, I don't know that symbol, Frederico, so if you could give me the symbol, I'll be happy. Or we can look it up. A-M-A-R-N. I'm not familiar with that stock. All right, let's see if we can find it. A-M-A-R-N. Amarin. Oh, it's A-M-R-N. I, I know the symbol. Don't know the stock. Uh, again, yeah, fat, fat gap here, so avoid that like the plague. I mean, it bottomed out, and now it's kind of dying out in here. See, it looked pretty good here, but again, you got the big fat gap, and then now it's dying out again. So uh, avoid that like the plague. FPP for Howard. FPP. Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. Okay. Um, any more? Again, thanks, everybody, for the patience. I guess you guys who are here, I don't have to apologize to. <laughs> but if you are watching the recording, um, my apologies for the snafu. Sorry about that. Uh, I promise to work hard to fix all these um, easy, these issues. Uh, anyway, everyone have a fantastic um, weekend. If we don't talk again, any, un any unanswered questions you tried to say, shoot me an email at Dave at Dave landry.com as you can tell i have a blast doing these shows so as long as you continue to show up and i promise to make it easy for you next week um i'll keep doing them so thank you so much everybody enjoy your weekend and then uh, i'll see you again next week thank you so much